Yep, I guess we should get uh, we should get started. So first of all, good morning to everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our session as the first, the kickoff session for the uh, for the summit. Um, as a quick show of hands, kind of how many people have already s um, set up OpenStack, have played with it? Okay, so about so about half, and then I assume the rest of you are are, are relatively new to the environment. Um, what we wanted to do today was run through some some thought discussions around around high availability, and I just noticed at the keynote that Intel has has issued a challenge of coming and setting up high availability clouds, which is something we've been focused on at SUSE. But but this isn't a product pitch. This is really talking about why HA is important, what you should consider as you deploy OpenStack, and then we'll show Adam will show a demo um, of one way that we that we have set up um, high availability. So first of all, this is why everybody's looking at, at, at private cloud computing, lower cost, increased um, agility, and, and, and the, the ability to, to respond more rapidly to uh, changes in the business environment. And then obviously control and security is why people want to do it in-house as opposed to go to a public cloud. But the important thing is once you've provided a more agile solution for your, for your, your line of business, and you start looking at what work workloads you want to move into the cloud, it becomes critical that the, that the cloud is always available. Now this is some work that, that a, um, Accenture Labs had done um, to look at what kind of workloads you can move into the cloud. Um, and you can see at the upper right is sort of the ones that are easiest to move, the ones that are the most, uh, the most value to the, um, and the most value to the business. So things like um, setting up a brand new business, I don't have to buy infrastructure to set the business up, I can just use virtual infrastructure through the cloud. Uh, batch and data intensive applications, so things that require lots of capacity but perhaps are fairly short periods of time. I think uh, numerical modeling if you're, in the, uh, if you're in the engineering business, something like that. And then peak load demands. So I need to spin up a bunch of servers right before the holiday season when people want to come uh, do online shopping. As you get over to the left, in theory, these are, um, I'm not sure why they say less value to the, to the enterprise, because most of what we see initially that customers are interested in doing is actually development and test. Uh, give my developers the ability to spin up virtual machines to do system builds, uh, to generate load by, by creating lots of virtual machines in the cloud. But one of the things that we're starting to see from our discussions with customers in, is an interest in moving more mission-critical applications. And certainly no application that's running in the cloud is going to be not important to the business. That's, that's the whole point. You're going to do anything that's going to be important to the business. But as you start to move more mission-critical applications into the, into the cloud, it becomes more, um, important to, to have it, things up and running all the time. Now, but part of the point is, uh, if you look at an enterprise, at best maybe uh, one quarter of the applications that you run in the cloud are not considered critical to the business. Whether it's mission critical or business critical, every workload that goes in the cloud is going to be important as you go forward in time. And so you need to start thinking about, okay, once I deploy an OpenStack environment, how do I make sure it's ready to handle um, critical workloads? So what are the things that we look about when we start talking about uh, OpenStack and what are the considerations um, that we and our customers went through as you start talking about how do I make that highly available. So the first question is what am I trying to protect? And the obvious choice is am I trying to protect the control plane, so the services, the OpenStack services, or am I trying to protect the guests? And our view is that the control plane um, is, is something that's important. You can have hot standby for the control nodes. Um, and the real, the real key here is that it makes sure that the cloud is always running, irrespective of what might happen to any particular given workload. When you start to look at, at, at workloads, you kind of have this tension between what I call Cloud 101, which is um, the best way to describe it is failure is not an option, it's a feature. I mean, you just assume that your cloud is going to fail. You know, you treat all your, um, your servers are, are cattle, so you don't care. They're going to go down. I'm not going to try and make them uh, redundant necessarily. Um, but I've talked to customers, and I say, well, you know, the, the cloud model of high availability is you just assume it's going to fail, and it, you, know, you just take care of that. And they look at me like, 
you're, you're, not, you're not serious about that, correct? I mean, you, we need to build um, highly available infrastructures. We need to be high, and, and ultimately, we want to get to highly available guests. Um, so you can look at high availability for guests, and we'll talk about that, and we've actually, um, Stratus Technologies is here, and they've got some interesting technology to, uh, to provide HA in the guest environment where you use, uh, if you're running Linux, you can use high availability tools at the VM level, um, multiple availability zones, so I run copies of VMs in two different physical environments. Uh, and if I do it correctly, I should have minimal impact on my, on my application versus sort of the Cloud 101 model, you probably have to rewrite existing applications to take advantage of multi-tier load balancing, um, which is kind of how, the, you know, how people uh, develop modern, modern applications, scale-out applications in an, HA, in an HA environment. But when it comes to compute nodes, this one's actually, we think, a relatively straightforward problem to solve. All of the services running in OpenStack are Linux services. Um, so you can use traditional Linux high availability tools um, to build clusters that provide um, excellent availability for the services. Um, you can have, um, uh, you can have uh, multiple clusters for the multiple services. So that's kind of what our focus really was, was on the, on the control plane. Now, if you look at, a, at an OpenStack distribution, um, I mean, this does happen to be what ours looks like, uh, Susan X or SUSE Cloud, um, you have an admin node, which is really just um, an installation service. Um, pretty much all of the distributions have that today where you install uh, an admin server and then that deploys the rest of the cloud. Then you have control node. Um, you can have multiple control nodes um, that have the various services on it. Then you, you, know, you have compute nodes and you have storage nodes. So our focus um, initially was really on how do I provide high availability around the control node. And the reason for that is if you look at the, uh, if you try to look at the impact of failures, so if the admin server goes down, that just means I can't add new physical nodes to my, uh, to my cloud. But, and, and I might not be able to, 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 to rediscover nodes when they, when they come back, but it won't have any impact on my actual operational cloud. Users will still be able to log in, start up virtual machines, all the virtual workloads that are running in the environment will keep running. Um, there's really no, no impact, and any impact that can actually be mitigated through standard uh, backup and recovery um, solutions. So you back up the state of the cloud. If your admin server goes down, you bring it back up, you, re you reinstall the state and away you go. If the control services go down, if the control node goes down, at a minimum, you can't start and stop guest images. But in reality, if you're running, uh, since you're running Cinder, you're running Nova, or running Neutron, um, if, if you lose the control services, you lose the control plane, pretty much your, your whole cloud is going to go away. Even existing workloads are going to stop running, um, uh, which is uh, originally um, back when we started looking at this, there was actually no impact on, on deployed instances, but now they, now they are. Now, if the compute node goes down, you're obviously going to lose all the VMs that are running on that cloud, um, and you have to restart, reprovision the server. Again, this goes back to how am I going to... Um, to deal with that, sort of the cloud way is that I have a multi-tier environment and I, um, I assume that my physical servers are going to go away um, so I can mitigate it through um, correct application design. So just as a way to introduce, so that's kind of the, the upfront non-technical discussion. So to introduce uh, some of the technical considerations, so this is just a very high level view of what, is a, what does a cloud look like. Um, you know, I have an orchestration layer sitting on top of a bunch of uh, physical servers with a hypervisor, and then I've got virtual machines running in that environment. And off to the left-hand side, I've got a control node, which is what actually is driving uh, the, the orchestration layer for the VMs. So kind of the first, the first pass at making things a cloud more available is I set up a cluster with my controllers in it, so I can run all my OpenStack services um, in a highly available cluster, and then I start setting up availability zones so I can put my VMs, um, and it doesn't really matter how I do it almost, um, but the sort of the cloud, traditional cloud architecture is I'd have 
multiple workloads, multiple VMs in the workload, move them, make sure they're not in the same availability zone, then put load balancing on it to make sure that uh, uh, things are running and I can run HA proxy so that when one goes down, I automatically move workloads over to, uh, over to the other side. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Adam, who's going to talk about sort of how we approach uh, the problem and then uh, run through a demo. All right. Is this thing on? Yeah. You can hear me at the back? Cool. OK. Um, so to go into a bit more detail about the approach we took, um, really, we could uh, use this as a kind of generic way, uh, a set of generic points about implementing high availability, because I think that it, it's kind of best practice across the board to some extent. Uh, a lot of other vendors have, have gone down this route or a very similar route as well. Um, so the first best practice is to fully automate your HA configuration. Uh, hands up, who, who has ever configured a, a cluster uh, manually before? Um, of those people who enjoyed it. <laughs> right. So <laughs> that, that demonstrates my point, I think. Um, it's, you know, setting up a cluster, you, you need to do it, um, but it's, it can be challenging. So having something that automates it and is well tested um, is important. We used uh, really standard open source components, uh, such as Pacemaker, DRBD, um, SBD, HA proxy, uh, components that you've probably heard of before. Other vendors are doing this as well. It's what the OpenStack project, if you look at the high availability guide, it recommends that um, you use these components. They're, they're proven, they're open source. So we went down that route. It seemed like the obvious choice for us. And in fact, we already have a high, high availability uh, product, which is our SUSE Linux Enterprise HA uh, product that uses those anyway. So. That was our decision. Uh, um, and we had to extend our deployment tool, Crowbar, to set up the cluster. And we did that by adding um, a new plugin to it. And in, in the Crowbar world, the pl plugins are called bar clamps. Um, so we created a pacemaker bar clamp that takes care of that automation. And um, we adapted our existing OpenStack scripts and uh, deployment configuration management um, code to to allow HA deployments. Uh, so we use Postgres, but of course, uh, MySQL is also, or MariaDB, or other databases are popular. That just happens to be the one that made the most sense for us. But again, using a DRBD distributed replicated block uh, device technology uh, for having a, a master-slave pair for the database and for the message queue so that if the, the master fails, then it um, you can fail over to the slave. That's one option that we've provided, but also, of course, shared storage is a standard uh, approach to that. So that the, the stack, uh, in a, a very simplified view, looks like this. Um, this makes it look like you can only have two node clusters, um, but as you'll see in the next slide, that is not the case in our implementation, um, but it's you know it's a, it's an okay starting point, but it doesn't scale. Um, so just a single cluster with the um, some form of shared or replicated storage, and then the OpenStack components on top of it. Um, what we recommend is something a bit more like this. Um, we really, with our approach, we decided it was important to allow as much flexibility as possible in deploying the clusters. So you. You're free to choose how many clusters you have and what you put on them um, and how, how many nodes you use for each one. So th this is a, a fairly standard configuration that we recommend. So you have your, your OpenStack services in one cluster, which can scale out very easily. Uh, it's all active-active and uses HA proxy for load balancing. Um, then a network cluster for all your neutron uh, components and then your database and message queue um, on a third one, and you you could even you know you could split those out into more clusters if you wanted and grow and shrink. Um, the only limitation there really is that if you're using DRBD instead of shared storage, then it has to be a master-slave pair generally. 
So I'll, I'll show you um, this in action. Um, another quick poll, who has uh, given a technical demo in front of a large audience before? <laughs> and of those uh, people who, who had it work flawlessly, <laughs> yeah, you're lying. Um, <laughs> So I'm slightly superstitious based on um, past experiences and traveling with the cloud on your laptop is, is not the best thing. So uh, you have to basically sacrifice a chicken to the demo gods before every demo. So sorry chicken, but um, hopefully that will help. Um, yeah, so I'm doing it from here. Brilliant, Stephen. Mm, I can I can just look on there. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is our crowbar web interface. This is our, again our deployment tool that we um, use to to automatically deploy a cloud, and it's the tool that we've extended to deploy a highly available cloud. So I mentioned earlier that it has these plugins. Uh, which Crowbar calls bar clamps. Um, I might as well show you all of them. So there's some core bar clamps uh, for just setting up basic infrastructure services on the on the uh, on these infrastructure machines. Um, but if we scroll down, we start getting to the uh, OpenStack related plugins, and the top one here is uh, Pacemaker. So we can have a look. Uh, in a bit more detail here. So here we only have a single cluster, um, but if you wanted at this point, you could enter multiple uh, cluster configurations and it would deploy them automatically uh, just by hitting create. So I'll show you the one that we've set up. And um, what we've tried to do, and um, I think this generally makes sense, it, for, for the specific use case of highly available uh, OpenStack infrastructure services is you you know enough about the workload that automating the deployment of it uh, to a cluster uh, can be fairly opinionated so that we've only exposed the uh, options that really make sense to be modified and the complexity is is hidden so hopefully you know you, you don't have to worry about that so much um, so one example of, of uh, a parameter that really needs to be exposed is uh, the Stonith fencing device. So clusters need fencing devices. I won't, won't go into the, the details now. Um, we have a session later where you can learn more about this this afternoon. Um, but the Stonith, if, in case you don't know, stands for shoot the other node in the head. Um, and it's a, a mechanism that um, protects the cluster against data corruption effectively. Um, so in this case, we're using a shared block device, sh common storage between the uh, the two nodes in the cluster as a communication medium, an out-of-band communication medium for fencing. So that's one option, and you can see that's being configured here. Um, and a few more parameters, DRBD setup. If you scroll down to the bottom here, then this is how you define the cluster membership, is that you just simply drag... Um, Roll uh, available nodes from here into here, and it's obviously it's already in there, so it's not it's not going to work now. But um, so so assigning nodes in the crowbar infrastructure to to clusters is as simple as that: drag and drop, and then you hit apply, and it just automatically creates the cluster. Um, so once you have the cluster up, uh, what does it actually look like uh, with all the services running? So again, yeah. So the fir the first step, maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Um, is um, is deploying the cluster, but then of course you have to deploy all the other OpenStack services, and you know, that's just the, the standard process, but in a cluster-aware fashion. Um, and this is a view of the cluster with all the services running. So we have the, uh, a column for each node in this two-node cluster. Um, in this particular view, and you can see the various services started. Uh, most of them just say started, but the uh, the rep DRBD uh, replicated block devices are in a master-slave pair. Um, so 
what I'm going to do, and this is where why the chicken had to die, is to um, kill some services and and then actually kill one of the nodes and uh, see what happens. So let's see if I can move this terminal over. Okay. Maybe make it a bit bigger. So here I am on the um, the main admin server, and I can SSH to one or other of the controllers in the cluster, um, and I can run a, a pacemaker utility for getting a quick view of the cluster. Um, I'm not sure how much how sl small I can go without it becoming unreadable at the back, um, but this gives us pretty much the same view as what we just saw in the web interface. Um, so here I have services like Keystone running, for example. Um, hopefully you can see that at the bottom down here. There. So if I w if I kill the uh, well, I'll just copy it. So if I go kill the process ID nine five six one. Um, and then go back to this view and let it automatically refresh. I'll try and um, maximize this window. Um, is it on the screen or is it scrolled down? Looks like it's scrolled down. Um, well, anyway, here we on 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 the web interface, which is a bit easier to understand. We see there's been a failure, but it's actually already started it up back up, so you can see it's running. Uh, here was the um, here's the little icon saying that the a monitor failed, but it's already started it back up. Um, and if I, let's quit this and run the uh, keystone, then you can see it running now. This is the first one here uh, with the new process ID. Um, so that, that happened very quickly. That's not that amazing because all, all it has to do is restart a single service on the node. Um, so now let's do something a bit nastier. Um, and let's see, so um, let's kill the this one, the second one. So that's the one that the uh, interface ends in 8F, which I believe is controller 2. Um, yeah, I can see the 8F. Did I say 8F? Yeah, yeah, E68F. Great. Okay, so controller two, uh, I'm going to go to, this is all running virtualized. So what I can do, um, oh, I'll have to do it on this machine actually. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll leave the um, this interface up and I'm just going to literally power off the virtual machine for controller two on here and then we'll watch the, the mayhem begin. So controller two. Reset. And the by the way, the, this web interface runs on all nodes in the cluster. So obviously, if it was running on the node that died, then that would not be very useful for seeing what's happening to your cluster. Um, so hopefully, uh, this is running on the right one, and the web interface will still stay running. Right here we go. Reset. Usually takes a few seconds for, because uh, I think the default monitoring interval is 10 seconds. So, on average, it, you'll have to wait five seconds before it notices. Um, so yeah, uh, everything stopped. Actually, um, in in that respect, um, I suppose it's it's not because this is this is largely an active active cluster. So. Um, there's not uh, so we have HA proxy as a load balancer front end for most of the services. So in this case, most of the services um, there's no failover because they're already running on both nodes. So the cluster is now just in a, a degraded state. Um, oops, I'm not very good at using this pointer. Ah. <laughs> 
Since when did buttons on touchpads become <laughs> out of fashion? <laughs> uh, let me just scroll down. Yeah, so perhaps I, sh I should have killed the other one. It might have been more interesting. Um, but th it gives you an idea of the experience that you get. Um, if you want to see more of this, like I said, we have a session. Um, it's a hands-on 90-minute lab, a workshop at 4.20 this afternoon um, where we let you build this entire setup from scratch on your laptop, assuming you have enough memory, um, <coughs> which really is 8, gig 8 gigabytes minimum, ideally 16 or 32. But um, uh, yeah, so you can actually um, build that this afternoon if you come along um, and, and then give it a, you know, have a, a proper play with it yourself and sacrifice more chickens. So just to, just to wrap up, one thing we wanted to do was, um, uh, let's see, go back here. Is it actually running somewhere? Oh, do you want to switch okay. back? Okay. Yeah. So, one of the things we talked about at the end was okay, so we've talked about the control planes, but my contention is that as much as I think, well, let me ask a question. <coughs> How many people are hoping that they never have to run? a pet in their cloud. If you're familiar with the pets versus cattle discussion, which I sort of don't like, the whole idea is that the way enterprise IT has historically worked is every server that's in the environment, you, you need to take care of it, you need to make sure it's fully patched, it's running, you, you, you give it a name, um, you know. Uh, Star Trek names used to be very popular. Um, uh, whereas when you're in a cloud, you just give it a number, and if the server dies, um, you don't care. I think that applies to physical servers in a cloud <coughs> environment, certainly. But, but our view is every workload that's running in the cloud is somebody's pet. Um, they're, they're running it to get some specific function done. So when we started looking at, at we started talking to people about, you know, what's the, sort of what's the approach, so we kind of said this is sort of the, the first step is that I have availability zones, um, and I have some of my host servers, are in, or and this could be as, as simple as I've got two different racks with two different power, s power sources. Uh, typically, you want different network sources, and it can be in the same data center. Um, and there certainly there are people, if you don't want to set up your own data center, there are hosted data centers that can guarantee you this kind of a, this kind of a control. And the idea is that if I lose availability zone A or I lose availability zone B, I have, I have servers that can pick up the workload. Again, as Adam said, using HA proxy, things like that, you can, you can automatically balance your, uh, balance your workloads across multiple, multiple physical servers. Um, and we, we talked about the control node and getting the services. So there's a couple different ways that people are looking at potentially doing high availability for workloads. One is you actually create um, an HA cluster. So effectively, um, if you do this, then Nova sees this as one big super cluster, or as one big super node. And as you deploy VMs onto that cluster, then um, it automatically takes care of, of how you do the balancing. And that's actually a fairly challenging um, task, uh, because you need to make HA work, you need resource agents, you need, you need to know how to monitor um, the individual workloads. Um, but there are, that is a solution that people are, are, are looking at. The other one is to do it at the VM level. So you can actually use all the Linux high availability tools, assuming you're running Linux workloads, um, to build HA clusters out of virtual machines. Um, and that, I think, is, is probably the, the simpler way to go. I mean, you still have to worry about things like, like resource agents, although you can potentially do it at the, at the hypervisor level. Um, and so you just treat everything that's running on top of the hypervisor as one big um, HA workload that you need to take care of. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, Stratus Technologies has, has, has got some stuff that plays on this. Um, and I you know, urge you to, uh, to, to kind of talk to them. Um, as Adam mentioned, we do have a hands-on session that Adam and, and Florian Haas from Hostexo are, are presenting at um, this afternoon. So if you, I guess it's 
I guess 241 is the other side. I don't know. It's a bigger room. Um, if you bring a laptop, um, you or actually can stop by the our booth downstairs and get all the files you need to actually set everything up in a virtual box environment. So you can spin up the virtual machines and, and, and configure the HA. Um, we've also got a couple presentations. Um, one of our uh, technical SEs, Simon Briggs, is, is going to be presenting um, at the Marketplace Theater. Uh, at 2 o'clock, and then at 5 o'clock, we actually have um, Jason Anderson from Stratus coming to present their solution in our in our booth. Um, I think that's, he may actually be doing a demo, not sure. So with that, we'll stop. Um, if there are any questions that we can answer. I should just mention about the, um, before, yeah, before we take questions, uh, so that if you want to come to the session later, that we, we did blog uh, last week about the the prerequisite um, hardware and software that you need for that. Like I mentioned, you need quite a lot of memory, um, eight gig absolute minimum. Um, <coughs> but you can feel free, like if you don't have the the hardware or your, uh, yeah, if, if you do, then come along to the booth and you can get the Vagrant boxes, but um, you you need Vagrant and VirtualBox installed. Um, we will, I'm not sure whether we have those downloaded as well to to give out, it may be difficult to download those from over the conference Wi-Fi if you don't have them al already installed. Um, but even if you, that all aside, feel free to just come along and just watch because we'll be showing it on the big screen and that all the resources are, are available so you can try it out at your leisure anytime after the event as well. Um, but if you come along, you'll get an idea of how it works. So yeah, questions? There's one at the back. Right. Th so the question is, what are, what is the uh, recommend uh, point? I forget the right recovery point objective and, and recovery time objective. So the, the on the on the time aspect, um, that that's kind of up for for tuning. Um, but our 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 goal was uh, basically that you don't need any manual intervention for anything. Um, that is a, a, some kind of critical outage which could impact cloud services, um, and that includes, you know, the not just instances. Um, uh, well, it's it's not about uh, instance HA; it's about the the services. So, from that perspective, um, our our timeouts um, probably uh, would result in a recovery within the order of. A a few minutes. Um, so I think something like a four nines um, level, I think, is realistic. And if you get aggressive with it and tune it in the right way and you have the right hardware resources, then five nines might be possible for for those services. Um, for the the admin server, like Pete, I think, already mentioned, um, it's more relaxed because if that goes away, it's not going to impact anything other than your ability to scale out the cloud further. Um, so that does require manual steps and would be of the order of probably hours or maybe a day. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Yeah. That's for the workloads. Um, yeah. So, so that's that's for the workloads, um, and that's actually stuff we've taken a look at, but haven't a solution yet. Um, Stratus is also taking a look at it, um, and they have a little bit more. So I'd suggest you talk to them to understand kind of how they're approaching that. Yeah. Um, that, that's monitoring and yeah right so so I, th I think the question is about monitoring I'll, I'll just say some explain monitoring quickly in general um, so uh, pacemakers resource agents will monitor all the resources in the cluster um, every 
10 seconds. Um, <coughs> so, um, and, but additionally, for the active active, the HA proxy uh, thing, HA proxy, proxy is running as a resource in the cluster. So that itself is active passive and can fail over. Um, and so HA proxy obviously has its own you know, monitoring um, values and, and timeout values. So it's, it's a two pronged thing effectively. Um, so I guess the worst case would be if, if your node running HA proxy dies, then you've got the timeouts for failing HA proxy over and then you've got you know, whatever HA proxy needs to do to, um, to start re redirecting traffic to the... Sorry? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I go to the microphone. Great idea. So let's say, hello. So let's say there is an existing cloud running, you know, two controllers in active active mode. I want to add a third node in. Oh, okay. What's your mechanism? Sure, okay, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's actually, that's just a drag and drop. So you go to the, the crowbar, bar clamp uh, screen. Um, well, so first, obviously, the, that, extra node, which can be deployed at any time, needs to regi register against Crowbar. So it can be deployed from bare metal with Pixie Boot, or you can register it running a script, and it will register against Crowbar. Once Crowbar has taken an inventory of that node and is aware of it, and it's allocated to the Crowbar <laughs> hardware pool, then you, you simply um, you just drag it into the existing configuration for that cluster. Yeah, so it's at the top. Scroll up a bit. Bit more. I can't do this looking backwards and uh <laughs> there, yeah. Up one more. Ah <laughs> It's not just me. <laughs> and then the ed edit button. And then you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom. Yeah. So there would be a new on the left hand side there would be a new one appear there and you just yeah. drag it in, you hit apply. Then crowbar You'd basically see controller three here, and then just drag it on. Yeah. So um, and and then crowbar orchestrates the whole configuration management run. So I'm not sure. I can't remember whether I mentioned, but crowbar uses Chef for configuration management behind the scenes. So there's a Chef server running, and um, it it runs the Chef client on all the nodes that are affected, and that will you know install the pacemaker packages, the all the uh, required packages, and, and and configure them and do everything basically. So it, it would probably take about two or three minutes, I guess, once you have the, once you, you know, and then another however many minutes it takes to provision the node from bare metal in the first place. Any other questions? Yep. Um, I have to admit, I'm not a rabbit expert. So, um, I mean, it's, I, I believe there's ongoing work. Um, it, is there ongoing work too? Yeah, well you can have, you can have mirrored cues or. It's dependent on shared stores though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there is, and it, is, is that supported in like ice house or yeah. So, so there there are other architectural options for Rabbit, and then of course you don't have to use Rabbit. You can use, you know, um, we either shared storage or replicated storage. Yeah, um, but we may look at supporting other options in the future as well, um, depending on demand. Okay, I think we're supposed to wrap up now. So, obviously, if you have any more questions, um, we're here all week. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks.